Top Bird Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bird Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Nick Majerison here. This piece is taken from the Perioptive Medicine Special Interest Group's 2018 Annual Conference, Measuring, Managing and Minimising Risk, which was held in association with the Australian and New Zealand Society of Geriatric Medicine and the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to check out the show notes on topmedtalk.com. In this panel discussion, you're going to hear Professor Jacqueline Close, geriatrician, Prince of Wales Hospital, Clinical Director, Falls Balance and Injury Research Centre, and also David Storey, Head of Anaesthesia, Perioptive and Pain Medicine Unit, Melbourne Medical School, University of Melbourne, and the Director of Melbourne Clinical and Transnational Sciences Research Platform. Also, Dr. Doug Campbell, anaesthesia specialist at Auckland City Hospital. Have a listen. All right, uh, opening up to question time, and I think I've got my, uh, my head around how to manage the, uh, uh, this electronic part of the questions, and I've had some quite, uh, quite a number of interesting questions that have, uh, that have come in. I'll try and get some of them in order. Um, David, I might start off with, um, uh, with you. One of the questions was, any subgroup analysis of older and or frail people in relief? Uh, the short answer is no. I, I would also, I was contemplating this question, I think it's important to point out that, um, that the older and frailer you get, the less likely you are to have elective surgery. And so this was elective surgery. The other point I'd make is, you know, consistent with what I was saying before, that, we, you know, that the, a lo- the very strong theme, as Jackie was just saying, has been age and frailty. And that is the the patient who you may consider much more, depending on how, what you decide, but if you assume the patient is for you know, full active treatment, then what you will engage in may be far more interventionist in the intraoperative and perioperative care than would be for a younger patient having the same surgery. So the short answer is no, and I think we need to consider how interventionist we are in higher risk patients, including the older and frailer patients. Um, and David, again, just in relation to the relief study, another question uh, asks whether the, um, uh, there was any mention of um, uh, pre-op fluid status as a central part of fluid reduction strategies. non steroidal were used in fluid volumes over the entire hospital admission. So one of the aims of the relief study, as has been the other studies, to try and make it as pragmatic as possible, and there were no real constraints on what was done or not done on that front. Um, you know, the, the Enigma studies and others have been the same. So... The short answer is there was no real attempt to uh, control or allow for those, but given that it was 3,000 patients, you would hope that the various approaches to fluids and non soils and things like that were equally allocated due to randomisation, which is the importance of, of randomising things, that the, the known knowns, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns are all randomly allocated to the two groups. Thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah. And uh, one question in respect to the uh, your mentioning of uh, prehabilitation tools and and, uh, and websites, a- any e-health tools that have been trialled for uh, in the preoperative setting that you're aware of? Not that I know of, but I would strongly suspect our physiotherapy colleagues have. Exp- uh, there is some exploration of using e-health in probably in the outpatient setting. You know, say weight loss clinics and things like that. I I don't know ex- of any explicit prehab tool. Um, if Bernard Riddle is around, he may know of one, but um, I don't know of one. Um, but I, I think there is probably a lot of uh, opportunity there. And um, finally, the place of goal-directed therapy, do you think there's a, a, again, in keeping with the findings in the release study, do you think there is a place for goal-directed therapy or we should just go with a prescription re- approach? Oh, uh, look, I mean, absolutely. I, that was what I was suggesting um, we, we need to remember the goal-directed therapy is, uh, it does have a cost um, and we need to be, you know, we are very fortunate to work in, you know, 
listening to uh, President Trump talk about Obamacare and things, thinking we live in country with, with Obamacare on steroids. And I think we're, we're all very grateful for that. Um, but part of the responsibility uh, is to look at value, you know, the, the quality over the cost. And I think um, one of my concerns with things such as goal-directed therapy is the, you know, just flat out give it to everyone. I would argue that the role of goal-directed therapy is to identify appropriate patients who will benefit from that therapy. As I was saying before, the, you know, the older and frail. So um, I, I think there's a role for both. And I suspect the role for goal-directed therapy will be, as we keep discussing in this, is to identify those who will benefit, and that's who you would target it with. Thank you. Um, Doug, your turn. The uh, question here is, um, your access to data is far better than, uh, than Australia's. Uh, so obviously this is one from a very envious Australian. Can, uh, can, you, can you get uh, much closer to real numbers than, uh, than the Aussies, and, and uh, do you have a solution of how, uh, how, how the Australians could get sort of a, uh, a similar access to data as you can? I, I don't see um, it being possible in Australia in the short term to ac- you know, access the kind of numbers we can generate from the national minimum data set. So, you know, for example... Uh, you know, on my laptop, I have 10 years worth of non-cardiac surgical patients with, you know, mortality and uh, days alive out of um, hospital uh, available to be analysed. You're not going to get that because of the dif- different jurisdictions. So I-, I see the only, for large database research, you know, ask your colleagues to help you out in New Zealand and, you know, hopefully it is generalisable to Australia. Um, question with respect to uh, Nesquip. Um, we found that Nesquip tends to overestimate risk. Isn't that better than scoring systems that underestimate risk? Um, well, so I'm interested in what, um, if there, that, that person clearly has local data where they are externally validating Nesquip and finding it is not as well calibrated in their local uh, practice as it is internally validated in the US. So, so what was the rest of the question? Uh, so the question there is um, uh, Nesquip uh, uh, overestimates risk. Yeah. And isn't it better to have a, a risk scoring tool that overestimates than one that underestimates? Um, I think we can get risk tools that accurately uh, estimate risk um, rather than over or underestimate, but you have to prove it by uh, externally validating it in your population. Another question is, uh, should I conclude that uh, all non-Australian calibrated risk tools are worthless in the Australian population? Um, No, they're not. Uh, So I think you need to, um, uh, you know, they are, I think, are they well calibrated is a hypothesis yet to be tested. Uh, Can they discriminate between high and low risk patients? I would suggest that any of those that have... uh, C statistics of close to 0.9 will translate well to the Australian uh, centres, but what you need is to define a local threshold based on, you know, let's say if we're talking about emergency laparotomy, a local threshold that will define appropriate um, uh, volumes, say, to ICU or HDU or to ward-based care. Um. Are there studies comparing a doctor's end-of-the-bed impression or estimate of risk uh, compared to that generated by validated risk calculator? And does it vary by specialty or experience? Uh, th- those kind of studies have been done many times in the, in the cardiology and oncology literature, and, uh, and well-validated risk calculators always are superior to the end of the bedogram. could also make the comment that the same has been done with frailty. End of the bed, there's an end-of-the-bed frailty study by um, physicians in New Zealand and found that there was a lot, you know, there's disagreement between the physicians and they did not really calibrate well with, the, I think it was the clinical frailty scale. If we don't know whether the Nella risk calculator is translatable to the Australian population, should we still be using it for the Anzella QI? Which risk calculation tool is, is most generalisable to Anzella? I think both Australia and New Zealand don't yet know which risk calculator is going to be appropriate for their setting. So, um, we have we now have uh, um, uh, an internally and externally validated risk calculator in New Zealand. Uh, I have yet to define its statistical properties in the emergency surgical population. Uh, 
Uh, Jennifer Riley will have an um, Australasian risk calculator in an, you know, available in the next year, I hope. Uh, which of those overseas risk calculators should you use? I think you should be using multiple and that as soon as you have data available from your laparotomy patients, one of the earliest projects should be to be externally validate based on local data. Arthur, Arthur can I just talk to that for a second? Yeah. So there was an Anzila meeting last night and this very topic came up. Um, and I, there was a discussion about whether we allow people to choose their favourite calculator. Uh, if James is here, I'm happy for him, James Aitken, who's the chair of the committee. But I, and this is partly a question for Doug, I would argue in the current state it's probably more important that we make an attempt to have a semi-quantitative discussion about the possible outcomes for our patients, particularly in the emergency setting, and what we think we should do than necessarily, and I think, to, to use a Churchill quote, you know, the, the, the calculators we have are the least worst options. Yes. And, and I think promoting a quantitative discussion about patient outcome is an important intermediate thing. And as we move down the pathways Doug is talking about to improve the accuracy of what we're doing, it'll become better. But I, I think the cultural shift is probably the important bit in the short term. I agree wholeheartedly, and I think also the the per, I think you need to separate out the purpose of the risk calculator in this context. In the in the laparotomy audit, you are trying to triage, so that so in that circumstance, all of these risk calculators have high C t statistics, so they will triage very well in terms uh, of the yeah. accuracy. Arthur James is up the back there. <laughs> Thanks, James. Yep. I'm James Aitken. I'm the chair of Anzila QI. One of the issues that we've discussed uh, in putting this together is trying to keep the data set to a minimum. And uh, all we've asked for at the moment is the um, final score. If you want the component parts, it increases the size of the data set very mm. substantially. And quite likely, the quality will fall off. So it's a bit of a dilemma as to how you balance that out. And if you then say we want to assess different calculators that need different data points to push up the amount of recording even further. Yes. Uh, um, well, uh, as I said in my talk, I describe myself as a lumper, uh, so I don't want large number of data points. You can do this very well with low number of data points. And in the NILA uh, 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 paper that's just been published with its risk calculator, uh, the, the best risk calculator after the NILA risk calculator was the sort surgical outcome risk tool with six covariates. Uh, the NZ risk uses those six covariates plus two others and will be applicable to a New Zealand setting. And I think uh, Jennifer is going along a very similar route. So I don't think you need large number, you don't need 22 covariate uh, risk calculators to do what you want to do. Uh, I, I certainly think it's something that we should explore, explore further. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, there was a lot of interest in your talk. Um, why don't we routinely measure absolute time from, from the fracture um, and or admission to fracture fixation, should we? We should, but we can't. So there is no mechanism for recording time of injury, unfortunately. So people get brought to hospital following the fall, but there's no documentation of the time of their actual injury. Some people are on the floor for two or three days. Some people are picked up within 30 minutes. There is no documentation in our current administrative data sets that tell us the point of injury. So, so we can't, unfortunately. I'm not saying it's not important. So we do the next best thing, the time that they present initially to hospital. And we also do very definitely include transfer times. So the last thing we want to see is gaming of the system in terms of um, manipulating your time to surgery. So there are hospitals that take in a lot of uh, patients from other hospitals. Your time to surgery starts from the point of presentation to the initial hospital, not the uh, operating hospital. Um, and there are clearly some hospitals that do this very well, and there are some hospitals that clearly struggle with the transfers. But what we don't want to see are people being left in the non-operating hospitals so that you transfer them on the day of surgery, so you make your time to surgery look wonderful if you're only looking at the operating hospitals. So we're, we're very careful about making sure we look at that length of time. 
And Jackie, can you recommend a one-minute tool uh, to screen for pre-op cognitive impairment applicable to the clinical and ward settings? So I use the 4AT, which includes screening for delirium, but within the 4AT is the AMT4, uh, so that's the abbreviated mental test 4, so 10 10 questions was too many for most people. So we're down to 4, which is age and date of birth, year and place. It is a really, really brief cognitive screen. And um, in, your, uh, in your study, who did the frailty screening and referral to the Shared Care Geriatric Service? So Christina is sitting down there. Um, Christina um, was the uh, fellow for the, the period of time that that was running. In fact, it is still running, so we've had funding to keep it going. Christina did the screening. Um, the surgeons actually chose the tool for the screening. So again, the surgeons preferred the pictures. Um, uh, and on the whole, the surgeons seem to be, as Doug calls them, lumpers. So the surgeons do not want big, fancy, frailty tools with 20 or 30 different variables. So most people relate to the clinical frailty scale um, very easily. Most of us feel comfortable with it, and it was Christina. But the, uh, the CNC in um, surgery also was able to, to use it. And in fact, the surgeons get it. They, they, they know now who to, to refer Given the, uh, given the improved outcomes of COPS, uh, which was in the acute surgery, is the next step to do pre-admission clinics with uh, at-risk older patients? Um, yes, almost certainly. Um, but just because something's successful doesn't mean to say that it is necessarily funded. And so we're still going through the battle of getting it funded. So Michael told us the other day that um, Nepean have now got their model of care funded long term. We're still with the business case with Prince of Wales getting it um, funded. It's still running. Um, Yes, the next step is potentially to go down the elective uh, route. We will probably use frailty as the identifier for the population that we want to see and we very definitely do not want to be setting up something separate to perioperative medicine. So it's working out how do we work with the perioperative medicine space to work out which patients we see and how we work together. So that is potentially the next step. Just to, uh, just to show you, I'm still a bit of an old-fashioned chair. I'll take a question from the audience. I'm um, sorry, I take exception to that. Uh, we don't know when the uh, fractured neck of occur. Having anaesthetised these patients... For 30 years, I and I still do. I doubt would have ever come across somebody who couldn't uh, time the fracture within a couple of hours. The vast majority, um, you would know with within the hour when it happened, and even the most demented, uh, probably poorly rated nursing homes, you'd know within several hours. Uh, we know that we've had hospital transfers from hospital to hospital to hospital, and know the time from when. Um, they had the fracture to when they arrived in the theatre, and that's almost universal. I'm going to choose to disagree. <laughs> and uh, one last question. Anybody? I'll, uh, can I'll, can I'll I just... Do... Sorry, yeah, go. Uh, I'll just go on for Jackie. I, I'd make the point there, I think one of the issues is, is we as clinicians can pick this up, but whether it's adequately recorded in notes, I think it that's isn't. probably more the difference. It isn't is that I entirely agree that if you quiz the family and quiz everyone else, you can often get a time. But whether that's actually adequately recorded for research and audit purposes, I think, is probably the bigger issue. There's no variable in the administrative data sets that tell us yeah. for a time of injury. Um, I disagree oh. with you. I mean, I, I agree it could be, and I agree it's easy to find, but whether if you went to 100 histories at your hospital... And Doug could find it 100 times out of 100. I personally would doubt it, but I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying... All I can say is wherever you work, you're bloody lucky. Yeah, I was about to say that as well. Um, just just one, I guess one point about the clinical frailty scale, just to confirm, Jackie, my understanding is that it is, there's evidence to support it's valid for non-geriatricians to use it appropriately as a screening tool. So it certainly has been used in non-geriatrician um, populations. Because yeah. I understand the uh, intensive care group are now looking at doing it routinely in intensive care patients, and there's evidence that both the research nurses from Sean Bagshaw, I think, in Canada showed that both research nurses and junior ICU doctors can adequately use the tool. So I think that's a particularly mm. important point in using that particular tool. Yeah. 
All right, thank you, everybody. Look, I'd like to draw the uh, session to a, to a close. Uh, can you please thank the, uh, the speakers? Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.